Hi, I'm Janet Jacobson, and I'm the director of uh, the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and I teach here at Barnard in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Um, uh, and this panel um, uh, actually grew out of a class that I taught with my colleague Elizabeth Bernstein, uh, who's in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Sociology. So we're very happy um, that you've been able to join us for this afternoon's conversation. Uh, before we get started, I just have a couple of thank yous and a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, I want to thank the staff of the Barnard Center for Research on Women, and in particular, um, Ann Jonas and uh, Pamela Phillips, who uh, do all of the um, programming and logistical support. And so please join me in thanking them. Um, and uh, I also want to thank Elizabeth Bernstein and tell you a little bit about the class that, that this panel grew out of. Uh, for many years since I came to Barnard in um, 2000, uh, this class already existed, but I was asked to teach a class on um, activism. And initially, it was conceptualized through uh, students who did internships and then uh, uh, reading and coursework around the issues that they were working on in their internships. And um, this year, with Elizabeth's help, we decided to um, do something that was more active and more activist, we hope, and um, hopefully successful, um, uh, which was the students did participatory action research with local organizations here in New York City. And the panelists that you see before us worked with our students. So um, in the world of thank yous, uh, the biggest thank you goes to them for the work that they did with uh, the Barnard students in the activism class, many of whom are here this afternoon. They're all lined up over here. Um, so let's just give them, even before I introduce them and they say brilliant things and then you clap for that, let's <laughs> clap for um, their willingness to work with our students. Um, and what I said to them when we all met beforehand is, uh, the reason we wanted to do this panel was sort of several fold. Um, one is that uh, we realized that the teams of students were working with individual organizations and then reporting back to their fellow students about what was happening in the organizations they were working with, but we never got the organizational people all together. Um, and that there's a real conversation to be had about what's happening um, around activism in New York uh, at the current moment. Um, and developing uh, an analysis that's connected or um, interrelated. Just to give you some ideas, a couple of different organizations, the students were working on the concept of gender justice, what does it mean, um, and yet, and talking to each other in class, and yet here are all these brilliant people that could be also um, sharing their joint knowledge about it. Um, and as I said to the panelists uh, right before uh, we started, if Elizabeth and I had thought of it, we would have done it during the semester. <laughs> Um, but we didn't manage it. Uh, uh, this was an experimental course. It was our first time through. But we um, were, had the good fortune that uh, a group of faculty here at Barnard are working on a project called For the Public Good. I will tell you that there was some debate at the upper levels of the administration at Barnard about whether an academic project could be for something or not. Um, but they decided that they could be for the public good, which we're very excited about. <laughs> And um, there's a conference that is the concluding conference to that project next next week. I've been projecting everything off uh, in the distance tomorrow, uh, Friday. Uh, and <laughs> um, that project focuses on questions of privatization, the ways in which um, neoliberalism and other funding structures are constricting the possibilities of being for the public good um, in the contemporary United States. And those are some of the issues that are also facing the organizations that were working with our students last semester. Um, so we thought this was a good opportunity to bring people together and have a serious conversation, not just about um, the inspiring issues like what is gender justice and how what strategies can better bring it about, but about the sobering issues like what is the funding structure and what are the effects it has on what kind of work can be done. Um, and there's some sense, and, and we'll each get a chance to talk about this a little further, that we're in a sort of, uh, Lauren Berlant talks about slow death, we're in a slow crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So that the crisis that started in 2008 as a funding crisis has continued on in various ways. Um, and we want to address that as best we can. Um, and one way to do that is to have some um, initial conversations together about that. So that's what brings us to this room. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to introduce each of our speakers uh, very briefly because um, you can find their websites, the organizational websites, um, and uh, uh, read about them more online. As I say, we always encourage you to read more about it. Um, and then they're each going to talk just for about five minutes about the work 
that they and their organizations do. And then we're going to have joint conversation and invite you all to join us in. So I'm going to start at that end of the table. We'll run down this way with the introductions and then reverse it. It's OK. You have to go first. Only. <laughs> it's because of where you're sitting. Um, so at the far end um, is Taloma Jayasingha, who is the executive director of Saki for South Asian Women, which is an um, anti-domestic violence organization. Um, we're currently at BCRW working with Saki to produce a report in the series that um, we term New Feminist Solutions. And there will be an event on the evening of April 4th for um, 9th. 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 I said 9th, and Chalom was like, no, 4th. So this makes me happy. It's always, if you're an academic, being right is very satisfying. Um, <laughs> so on April, April 9th, um, for further discussion and celebration of this project. So if you're interested, please come back on April 9th to have further discussion specifically about um, uh, the work that Saki is doing. Um, next to Taloma is Sydney Mosley. Sydney is a 2007 graduate of Barnard College. She was two years ago our first alumni fellow. Um, she's a choreographer um, and uh, has her own um, dance company called Sydney L. Mosley Dances um, that works here in Harlem. And we um, work with her on a project that she'll talk about called the Window Sex Project, um, which is activist dance. Um, so we're happy to have Sydney back always. Um, Amber Halaba is um, the former executive director of Queers for Economic Justice, QEJ, um, and is now, along with Raina Gossett, who is sitting next to Amber, uh, um, an activist fellow at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. We're very ha happy to have both of them uh, with us. And um, uh, oh, oh, and Amber's book, uh, what is the name of your book? My Dangerous Desire is yeah. a Queer Girl Dreaming. Yes, uh, uh, is one of the readings that the students had in class. They're sitting there smiling at me. <laughs> they liked that one. They didn't like them all. <laughs> um, next to Anver is Raina Gossett, who is also a BCRW activist fellow, is an activist and artist, and also works at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. Next to Amber is Penelope Saunders, um, who works with Best Practices Policy Project. Get all my P's correct. Um, which supports activism um, uh, around sex work um, and policy analysis. Um, she was formerly the executive director of different avenues in Washington, DC, and we're very happy to have her with us and thankful again that she would work with our students. And then Kate D'Amato is community organizer for the Sex Workers Outreach Project um, and the Sex Workers in New York. Action New York. Action New York. Sex Workers Action New York. Swain. Um, so thank you. So we're going to start with Kate, and you can either speak here or here, depending on what um, you prefer. Um, and we'll do our five minutes, uh, and then we'll have some conversation. Uh, thank you, and thanks so much for being here. And um, it's it's a, an honor to sit among such amazing activists, and to be able to have this conversation. I think is a really it's an interesting conversation, and it's a, a conversation that doesn't really get had. So I'm just kind of really excited to to be a part of it and to engage. Um, with you amazing folks and, and with you guys as well um, around this topic. Um, I'm a community organizer with the Sex Workers Outreach Project here in New York. We're a local chapter of a national network. Um, and, and we do kind of a variety of things. We're, we're two halves of a whole, I like to talk about it as. Um, so through the Sex Workers Outreach Project, which is a grassroots membership-based organization of people impacted by the sex trade, both current, former, and transitioning. Um, we do political advocacy, we do community building, we do media outreach, um, trying to shift the narratives about people in the sex trade and um, advocate for better policies um, and uh, help people kind of work happier and healthier in the sex industry. Um, and then on the other side, we have SWANK, which is Sex Workers Action New York, and don't try to put together the acronym. Um, <laughs> it's a, a worker-only space, current, former, and transitioning. Um, and what we do through that is really, it's a lot about kind of peer support and um, worker-based knowledge. You know, when you get involved in the sex industry, you don't get like an HR handbook that mm. says like, this is how you get better, and this is, these are your benchmarks, and every year you're going to have a, a formal review. And so really compiling the knowledge uh, and the expertise of people who have been working in the trade, um, curating a safe space often for a lot of folks who have never said those words out loud or been comfortable um, sharing their experiences and knowing they're in a space where even if people have differing experiences, there is a, a baseline of understanding, um, especially among a criminalized population, is a, an incredibly powerful um, uh, 
moment for a lot of folks. Um, and so through Swank, we are able to do, um, like I said, peer support, um, curation of safe space, community building, um, and then everything into kind of professional development in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So sharing uh, skill sets, development of resources, um, and uh, doing outreach to better sensitize um, everything from service providers to journalists um, about the experience of uh, folks in the sex trade. Mm -hmm. So I am Penelope Saunders. I'm also a member of Swap NYC and uh, various other groups. And I can't tell you uh, how important that work is to me and how hard folks in these grassroots groups work. Like the work is of the highest standard, but it's completely community based. So, um, you know, I'm just always in, um, I'm just so glad that these organizations exist, but I know it comes at a cost and people work very hard and there's still so much more to do. I always think about it like this. There are so many millions of people, for example, in New York City, and now we have a few more organizations um, uh, you know, this year than we did when I first arrived in New York, which was in 1997. So we have a bunch more groups, but there are so many millions of people out there who need information and, and, and need support and would just like to hear about the rights of sex workers. So we need a lot more organizations and our organizations need to be larger. So that's part of what I do at the Best Practices Policy Project, which I hasten to add is also a volunteer organization. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized that there were a lot of things that I could connect people to, like resources, grants, um, demystify certain policy processes uh, that would help activists at the grassroots and just mm -hmm. make their job a little easier. So that's what I do some of the time. Uh, the rest of the time is that we try to take our right struggles to the national arena. Uh, so we would work on the Desiree Alliance conference every two years and create spaces for people to come together and work on policies and work on, you know, sharing knowledge, whether it be about how to engage in sex work in a different way or to address a policy issue or how to write a letter, you know, uh, you know, how to approach the media. All of these things are discussed at a Desiree Alliance conference. So that's one space that we work in nationally. But then uh, because of who I am, which is an immigrant into the United States and certain connections that I had from before I came into the United States, there's also our connection to the global issues. And through um, my knowledge of some UN processes, uh, we have managed from within the grassroots in the United States to engage with certain quite important United, Nation, United Nations processes, specifically the Universal Periodic Review in 2010. We wrote a report with organizations and activists all around the country and with the Desiree Alliance for the first time to say to the United Nations, here are the human rights issues facing sex workers and people in the sex trade and all the other people who are not necessarily in the sex trade but still affected by these laws and policies, here are the human rights issues in a five-page report, and please hear us, world. And quite amazingly, the world did hear us mm -hmm. and made a recommendation um, to the United States that the U.S. should do a better job mm -hmm. in keeping sex workers and um, transgender people uh, linked to services and reducing their vulnerability to violence. So yay for the global arena. And we're continuing on with that work in a variety of ways, working on the um, uh, ICCPR, which is the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. That's what we've been doing in the last month or so. And taking Monica Jones's issue. She's someone who was arrested in Phoenix, but she's also an activist. Um, she was arrested on uh, quite a silly uh, but very important to them, uh, law against prostitution. Mm -hmm. So we took her issue to the United Nations. So we're continuing on with that. So there's a lot to discuss, but that's what we do and that's how we're connected to Swap and Swank and uh, a lot of the other people here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm Marina Gossett and the, I had a really amazing time this fall working with students. Um, it started off around conversations around reproductive justice and reproductive oppression. 
and so often um, trans people and gender nonconforming people, particularly trans women of color, are left out of those conversations about what a reproductive justice issue is. So a lot of it, um, our conversations, our beginning conversations were about what, were, what are sites of reproductive oppression that trans and gender nonconforming people are daily having to navigate. Um, and they're ones that people don't necessarily think about. Uh, so we talked about how up until recently the Social Security Administration required a sterilization procedure for trans women in order to change your gender marker. Or mm -hmm. how, um, and that was a site of reproductive oppression. Or how uh, prisons, jails, and detention centers often place people based on um, their genitals, right? And that's a site of reproductive oppression. Um, because in order to get some level of safety, we all know prisons and jails are inherently unsafe, but in order to get some level of safety, uh, trans women would have to go through a particular form of surgery, that would, uh, which is also a sterilization surgery, um, and it's a form of surgery that not everybody wants, sexual reassignment surgery. So we talked about that, and um, we had great conversation around that. And then we also talked about, uh, that led us more into access to healthcare in general, and about um, right now in New York State, like many other states, uh, though there's like the American Medical Association has said all healthcare for trans people is medically necessary and should be covered. Um, poor people in New York State, particularly trans people and gender nonconforming people, are unable to access healthcare um, through Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid has a regulation that forbids any coverage of trans related healthcare. Um, and our communities know when we don't have the health care that we need, our suicidality goes up, our mental health goes down, um, we're less able to take care of our bodies because we feel not as good in our bodies. Um, and also, but also, people are incredibly resilient, right? So they um, would find all sorts of ways to get their health care met, needs met. So whether that's um, accessing uh, treatments through criminalized economies or engaging in criminalized work in order to afford treatment. Um, our folks are, are resilient and powerful and capable of um, getting what we need, um, but the ways that it, the processes through which we're doing it are, are criminalized and um, are sites of reproductive oppression. So it was a really amazing conversation because right now the Affordable Care Act, it's like we're running into um, the end of enrollment which, but the Affordable Care Act, uh, just like Medicaid in New York State, doesn't actually cover trans-related health care. Um, so we had conversations about like that in the, you know, kind of throughout the U.S. and also in New York. And then the students um, took an opportunity to reflect back on access to health care in at Barnard, um, and found that the Barnard Insurer Aetna doesn't actually cover trans-related health care either. Um, and that was a moment to link um, issues that uh, low-income people and people of color who are transgender nonconforming are navigating on, outside of Barnard to what students here um, who are transgender nonconforming or um, you know are supportive or allies of trans people uh, have to navigate. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of our conversation. And it was really inspiring. The students that I worked with, two of whom are here, um, were fabulous. They came to, to Queers for Economic Justice, um, and um, one of the, and Queers for Economic Justice is the only, actually, or was the only um, LGBTQ organization, as Suzanne Farr said, that has economic justice in its title. Mm -hmm. um, and our work was framed to try and make um, the impact of economics clear at the intersection of sexual orientation and gender identity. And it means that we did an enormous amount of work in homeless shelters um, and with homeless populations of queer folks that were adult, not youth. Um, the director of the shelter project in New York, Jay Tool. Um, is a gender variant Stone Butch who lived um, as a homeless person for about 25 years. Um, and so QEJ did an enormous amount of work around that. Um, but we also did um, work that people, I think, found confusing for us because they kind of thought of us as a queer poverty organization. Um, but we were the ones that um, 
created the convening that wrote Beyond Same-Sex Marriage um, as an alternative to the marriage argument made by kind of LGBT equality organizations. Um, we were part of um, we were part of an organ of a structure to build a queer left. Um, we did, in fact, Reina was part of QJ staff um, and helped organize uh, wo uh, welfare warriors, which were queer homeless folks or previously homeless folks who did a community participatory research project so that queer people that were poor could identify and name their own issues about poverty and then talk to other queer poor people about what they thought the priority issues were around poverty and queerness. Um, QEJ has always been an organization that was very committed to sex politics, to a radical vision of sex politics as a fundamentally important part of queer identities, that you don't give up desire for equality, um, and that the most marginalized parts of our community are not actually a minority, <coughs> but a majority of who's queer, even if we're not a majority at the table. That class and race um, are configured in a way that queerness never becomes visible. And therefore, the agenda that's set as a queer agenda is an agenda that doesn't include the majority of who we are mm -hmm. or reflect the reality of what we would prioritize. Um, and that has always been QEJ's um, vision. Um, so I don't think it's an accident, though it's sad, to say that we've, I've had to close QEJ um, because of funding. Mm -hmm. and. Um, when you have an organization that has that kind of vision and is very clear about the driving force of what's happening in this country as something specific to capitalism and says the word, actually says the word, um, in, their, in our mission statement, um, it is a more complicated thing to try and go to funders who um, get very upset when you use any language that suggests that there's root causes of poverty um, rather than that you're going to serve poor people because how generous of you. Um, so QEJ has had to close and the students that came from Barnard had to sit in the midst of the struggle that we found ourselves facing around the reality of economics in QEJ. And I don't think it was an accident. Um, feel bitter, but it is, I think, not an accident and needs more conversation about what it means to have a vision that a uh, progressive vision in a funding world that is more and more um, less and less willing to underwrite anything that is structurally, structurally radical. Mm -hmm. um, and that we need to be talking about that more because the funding world has done quite well in recovering from the recession of 2008, but uh, the number of organizations that are going under are multiplying um, as, as they're doing quite well, actually. Mm -hmm. Ford Foundation is not struggling for money for its dockets. Right. Um, and so I think we need to, to say that the, the kind of the world of funding for many things like a progressive vision of sex work, of queerness, of trans health, of the other folks that are sitting here at the table is a shrinking world at a moment when the funding world is expanding again from the recession of 2008. And we have to talk about what that means going forward because while I think there's an enormous commitment to all of us doing um, organizing work, whether it's paid or it's not, the ability to impact the structure that is um, controlling us is fundamentally altered by whether or not you have an ability to staff a project, write papers, be at meetings that happen during the time you're probably trying to work full time and support your own life, mm -hmm. um, and that we have, you know, we have to build movements that can sustain us whether the funding world underwrites us or not. But we also have to talk seriously about the repercussions 
of the recession and where we all find ourselves as we're working with students at Barnard to try and address the kind of issues that this panel represents. I'm just going to move places because I actually want to show you a little video. Oh, great. It's not amazing. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sydney Mosley, again, and I am a dance artist, I am an educator, and I'm an activist. Um, and I want to start off by saying that I enter this conversation and this world of activism through the lens of specifically as a dance artist. Um, in 2011, I connected with the Barnard Center for Research on Women with a project that I was doing called the Window Sex Project. And that was a dance activist work about street harassment. Um, I had been experiencing a lot of um, issues around harassment in my own personal life. And as an artist, I essentially just dance out everything that um, is going on. <laughs> so um, I used um, that issue as is really um, a springboard for a larger community-based work based here in Harlem. Um, and that work um, was multi-layered. The first layer of it being organizing um, young women in my community around this issue, bringing them together for workshops and giving them uh, resources, practical like conversations around like what to do when things happen to you on the street, how to respond, how to uh, how to also become an activist around the uh, around the issues, um, and then also there was a creative side where the women were given a space, a safe space to tell their stories, and then to also dance about those stories. Um, so I actually just quickly want to show you a little video of like what that workshop looked like, um, just because I feel like I talk about it a lot, but unless you're there, nobody ever really knows what's happening <laughs> when I say you know dance about your story. So. Um, I'm just going to push play and keep on talking. Um, but what would happen um, is I would basically use my expertise as a choreographer and come up with prompts, task-based prompts, um, and ask the people who were participating to uh, create dance movements based on those prompts and also um, based on their own experiences. So the prompt here was to think of um, a part of your body that attracts the most attention when you are out in public space and then to create movement around that. Um, and eventually what we did was working with the dancers take that movement and create an evening length dance work. Um, so as you're watching that, I'm just going to keep on telling you a little bit more about my work, um, which was in 2012, I was able to self-produce this evening length work um, around the street harassment, um, using this movement and also movement generated by the dancers. Um, and the reason why I was able to self-produce that work was because it was a community activist project, because I had made connections with an institution such as Barnard. I'd also made... Um, connections with other institutions such as Holla Back and Stop Street Harassment and all and other activist organizations around uh, this issue. Um, but the problem was that I was spending also a lot of my own personal energy and my own personal money in order to make this work happen. Um, and when we talk about a conversation around economics and activism and economics and arts, specifically in dance, um, what ended up happening was it took a toll on me personally, even though this was an issue that a lot of people were invested in um, and a lot of people were really wanting to do work around. Um, and so, um, and so the, my, I guess I should say my artistic trajectory now is where I am working on a second project called Body Business and using that project as an inquiry into how to make dance um, in a way that is not gonna kill me essentially <laughs> um, for lack of better terminology um, I, I, I will say this and then I'll sit down and be quiet but um, the reason why I started off by saying is that I'm entering this world as an artist I'm a trained modern dance artist and what that means in the in terms of economics and labor is nonprofit dance and just in the way that uh, money has dried up for uh, for activist causes the money is essentially gone for nonprofit dance as well and so as um, as a dancer who is coming out of that tradition, I'm doing a lot of questioning about what 
business looks like, uh, sustainability looks like as an artist, um, as opposed to just following the, uh, the traditional trajectory of starting a 501c3 because that's what Martha Graham did. So there's a lot there, <laughs> uh, but that, that's, that's what she so I have one of my the students that work with me. Emma is here. Yay. Um, anyone else that I'm missing? No. Okay. So I'm Tiloma Jaisinga. I'm the executive director of Saki for South Asian Women. And so I had so much fun and I learned so much from the team that worked with me um, through Barnard around an extracurricular project because um, this is not for Saki. The work they did was not necessarily for Saki, but um, they did research on the state of the field around South Asian women's organizations across the U.S. There are 30 organizations, 31, like Saki, across the U.S. So we are South a created by South Asian women for South Asian women around one issue, around domestic violence. And um, Saki's second oldest, so we're 25, and the oldest one's 26. And we've been doing work for the past 20 years around one issue, which is very a very intersectional issue, but the lens has been domestic violence. And I wanted to create an umbrella network called the South Asians for Gender Justice Network. You know, I wanted to have a broader term for the work we do and to progress and to do more work in our community that was more than just domestic violence. Because for what it's worth, the only organizations in the South Asian community in the US uh, uh, that do any gender related anything are the DV organizations. So there's not a reproductive justice one, there's not a youth one, there's there's nothing. I mean, in our lens and our in our inroads into our community around are around the, around violence against women issues, which it, which permits doors to open along a whole other host of related movements for social justice and different parts of our society. But the way we've all done our work because of funding uh, has been really around services, around you know helpline, hotline crisis responses, and so they did a state of the field to see you know where were people at in terms of their capacity, buy-in, um, size, lens for the work. And we used one particular piece of legislation to test where people were at in a way called the Prenatal Non-Discrimination Act. Um, there are state-based versions of this throughout the country, but in May 2012, Trent Franks of Arizona proposed this before the House of Representatives, um, federal, a federal piece of legislation, the acronym is PRENDA. And it is a race and sex selection abortion ban. And so no one should abort their baby because of the race of that baby. No one should abort a baby because of the gender of that baby. And in the reproductive justice communities are very strong, vibrant Latina and um, African-American organizations that jump on this and are like, oh, hell no. Like, do you remember the billboards? Does anyone remember yeah. the billboards yep. that pop up? Yep. The most dangerous place for mm -hmm. a black baby is in his mother's mm -hmm. womb. Ridiculous. In 24 hours, Sister Song organized in New York City yep. when they put up that one by the <clears throat> Holland or Lincoln Tunnel. It was down. So this is a well-organized community, and so that part of the bill often gets dropped. But the sex selection of abortion ban language remains because that's more targeted to um, East and South Asians. I mean, we can't deny in our countries of origin there has been, there is, I mean, practices, sex selective practices up to in, and including abortion. But we don't know what the reality is in the U.S., but we can't deny it. But we would get a call from, um, actually, our sister organization in New Jersey, Manavi, got a call from Trent Frank's office saying, surely you will sign on and support this bill because you do anti-violence work. You're South Asian. You don't want baby girls to be aborted just because they're girls. And if you're a DV organization, you hear this, and you're like, of course I'm against it. I'm not for this kind of, no one should feel like they have to abort their fetus because of the gender of that fetus. But that's wrong. I mean, we all agree that, no, that you shouldn't have to have an abortion for any reason other than what you want, but the legislation of it is wrong, is the wrong response. If we're going to address sex selection or gender preference in any community, it has to be about uplifting the status of women and girls, and, you know, right. but not about legislating away a woman's rights over her own body. That mm -hmm. level of nuance is something new to the South Asian women's organizations because for the past 20 years, we only got funding to do helpline and crisis response. So we never got the chance to think mm -hmm. or to develop progressive thought leadership around the host of issues. And so um, because I saw that as the ED of Saki, I'm like, we're amazing. We should be so rich. We should do so much work. The need is huge. And our staff is eight. 
how am I going to raise money? And I realized that I'm not going to get the national big funders because they've been explicit about saying they're going to write larger checks to larger organizations. Like Ford is rich, but they won't support the innovation of our movements, which come from the smaller organizations who work in and amongst their communities and, of course, of individuals that are not necessarily affiliated with organizations. There's got to be a way to fund people, you know, without us always aligning ourselves with letters behind our name, like the stamp of approval from an institution, or uh, by the title that we hold in our institution. So I'm like, you've got a whole host of immigrant women of color post 9-11 who are being targeted through legislation across the board. Muslims, you know, we wear hijab, and we don't have a united voice. So you can do whatever you want to us, and only a small organization like Saki is supposed to step up. There's a there's a silence that's happening. I mean, everyone on this panel are working with silenced parts of our community. And so from my lens, where I sit with my organization, I see the silencing of South Asian women and girls, immigrant South Asian women and girls, and in fact, policies and stories being put upon us. So I thought, why not create a national network and get that national money or speak with a united voice when things pertain to us? Um, and that's, you know, that's hitting its own hurdles. There's no money out there. Right. But the idea and the concept and the interest amongst the other organizations are there. So we have to find ways to do this work, funded and unfunded. I, I believe like the revolution will not be funded, right? Like right. that's fine. It's going to continue. I also really strongly get very angry when people have to bear the personal cost of activist work. No one should have to make decisions about their own bread and their own home and working for others, right? And in the domestic violence movement, we have high rates of burnout because that's what you do. No one is funded enough. And when you keep hearing women crying with you with traumatic stories and you can't give a response because you don't have the capacity, it's very traumatizing. And so I think across the board, we all bear some sort of personal cost for the activism that we hold. And then I really squarely put the capitalists. Yeah. There are enough resources out there. It's how it's being allocated. And if there is social, social capital, if capitalism, if you could make money and if it could be allocated in, in fairer ways, I'm down with that. But right now, the in unequal distribution of wealth and resources in our country the way the whole Occupy um, Wall Street movement really brought to most of mainstream society. I'm rambling on. I'm going to stop. But like, I feel very strongly about like, that there are resources out there. And I'm, I'm all for people doing well and making money where they can and giving it where they need to. If it is, But I want to have a say in that. Like, I want to be able to allocate resources to me and to mine, to the silenced people. And who's going to speak for them? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I see just a lot that we can talk about uh, that's come out already, and then I'll ask, uh, and so I'm, I'm signaling this to you guys to think about, are there things you want to ask each other or that come out of the questions, the pre-panel questions that you want to pull up right now, while I just uh, summarize some of what um, we've heard already, um, you know, sort of working backwards, these questions about what can and can't be funded, it seems, are some of the crucial things that we're here to talk about today. Arts, mm -hmm. you know, the, if you were to name these things and say, oh, unfundable, like, the, uh, arts, unfundable. Um, innovation, again, isn't that the word we're all supposed to use in order to get funding? And yet what Taloma just told us is that, in fact, the organizations that are smaller and more likely to do innovation are the ones that are um, less likely to get funding. Um, smaller, community-based organizations. Again, isn't that something that gets, it, certainly in these places, the academic places, this is used all the time um, as uh, a site through which, uh, to which academic institutions should be reaching out. Um, and then structural analysis. Is, is it possible to do structural analysis and still get the work done? So those are some of the um, questions that came up. And then what are the personal costs to this? I mean, you know, especially, it's very interesting to watch as we go through a panel like this, what comes up by the end, so the second half of the table. I think that was really <laughs> becoming much more clear. Um, some other issues that came up that weren't just about funding. What's the relationship between providing services and doing activism? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of your organizations do both um, in some way. So how do we think about that relation is an important one. And then what does gender justice, reproductive justice, 
uh, uh, sexual justice, what do these terms that are used both in academic and activist settings, what do they really mean and how can we think about them? So those are some of the things I um, uh, just came out of this opening statement to talk about. I want to ask panelists um, if there's something they want to really talk about and my hope is we'll have some conversation amongst all of you and then we'll bring in uh, everybody else for more conversation. So initial thoughts. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things <laughs> that, that you were saying. Um, I'm, I'm also thinking about some of the pre-panel questions that you gave out. Um, and one of those questions was about just, I guess, the contemporary context. Um, and I feel like for specifically the work that I'm doing um, around street harassment, um, Part of the reason why I've been able to do it is I feel like I'm riding a wave um, right now where that issue is very prominent. And part of the reason why it is so prominent is because a huge part of the street harassment movement is also, um, it's not only coming out um, through the work of artists like myself, but also through um, technology and through you know, online activists, um, Twitter campaigns, and actual mobile technology that has been created to, um, to track harassment. Um, and I say all of that to say that um, by kind of just being timely with the movement, um, that has made the work possible. Um, but I am thinking because for me, the work is ongoing, um, how how will it be sustainable beyond a trend of, of activism? Um, and that, that is a question that I'm constantly thinking of. Um, so I'll just throw that out into the air. Yeah. That makes me... Okay. Yeah, Raina, go ahead. Well, I just, I um, have so many questions for you. I'm really <laughs> impressed with your work. And I'm, I'm also thinking about, um, makes me think about people who do not have access to technology mm -hmm. to document or, um, through the levels of trauma mm -hmm. um, that we're navigating on the street. And it also makes me think about the um, folks who are so often the predators of our community, um, who are s sometimes imagined to be people we rely on for safety. Mm -hmm. Like for example, mm -hmm. in New York, um, I think there's a couple things. When, it, we, when I was working with the Welfare Warriors and just in my own personal experience, like police often stop mm -hmm. and harass trans women of color. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is because sex work is criminalized. And part of it is because of racism and transphobia. Um, and that is like a, one of the primary predators, I think, for our community is police stopping and strip searching mm -hmm. um, trans women, like mm -hmm. black and Latino trans women. Mm -hmm. And that's never, like, I haven't seen that talked about on Twitter. And so I think about um, like lack of access or barriers to accessing ways to share your story or connect with other people. Mm -hmm. And then I also think about, um, I don't know, the amazing yeah. work that you did and you just showed on, on the screen. So mm -hmm. I, like all of these things, um, uh, like who is seen to be um, a predator? Like is it just the like, person on the street or are we thinking about the police as primary predators? Um, mm -hmm. Are we thinking about like um, issues of like, you know, in New York also people, um, I mean y'all can talk about uh, condoms as evidence, you know, like there's just a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. Kate. Well, I think for me, one of the things that <clears throat> came up, and um, as I was reading the the questions beforehand, and came up a number of times, is uh, the impact of. I, I think the recession uh, really highlighted it, but it's a process that's been going on for a very long time. Is the criminalization of informal economies and the criminalization mm -hmm. of economic justice in and of itself. Um, and I, I approach uh, sex worker activism through um, a, a primarily economic justice lens and a labor rights framework um, and, and access those, that framework and that terminology a lot more than um, probably a more traditional human rights framework. Um, and so, so much of the criminalization of not only sex work, but things like, you know, what is, is so mistermed welfare fraud and right. um, mm -hmm. drug-based economies and informal economies in general. Um, the, the parameters put on them and the, you know, I think what you're saying about how everyone's knee-jerk reaction is like, well, let's outlaw it if we don't understand it or if it doesn't fit into the specific formal model that we have. Um, and so, you know, there are laws against 
uh, these different forms of accessing economic justice because they don't fit into uh, a lens and because they're accessed by people who are marginalized from the formal economy. And so how do you control, you know, it's very, it's very three guineas Virginia Woolf, but you know, how do you control a population but you limit their access to resources. And so the answer has been to criminalize things like sex work, criminalize um, everyone around a sex worker to kind of marginalize and isolate them. So, you know, when you talk about pimping laws, you're, it's literally defined as living off the resources of someone where you know those, those resources have been gained through prostitution. And so you're talking about roommates, partners, adult children, mm -hmm. um, community members, peers, um, overwhelmingly. And so, you know, the, the criminalization of these different forms is really about um, isolating people and marginalizing communities and making sure that the only alternative is a dependence on the formal economy and a dependence mm -hmm. on um, populations who have access to power. Um, and so for me, I think this is so much of what that comes from. And so when you see, you know, Amber, as you were saying, like the funding community is, is resurgent and they're coming back and they're, they're making larger and larger contributions. And the other thing that really came up for me was they're making larger contributions to advocacy organizations who are not accountable to impacted populations. That's exactly right. um, and so all of a sudden grassroots has become, I care about this. Um, and so, you know, you'll see, uh, I know on the sex worker side, we deal overwhelmingly with anti-trafficking organizations that are grassroots because someone read a news article and cared as opposed to I'm going to advocate for policies because they impact me and because they impact my community and I best understand them because I have the expertise in the room. Um, and, so, and, and so funding streams become this echo chamber of people who aren't accountable and aren't transparent and have zero relationship to not only the populations they're dealing with, but the policies they're even enacting. Um, and so I think those, those two pieces, this um, criminalization of a population, of, of these populations as a means of uh, social control, um, you know, relocating what personhood means, even what is what is crime, but literally defined as a process which turns a person into a criminal. Um, and it's a it, like if you, if I looked it up, it is the definition. And so you know, removing that personhood, all of a all of a sudden allocating it to criminals, marginalized populations, and corporations and people who have access to power. You know, if you're following the Hobby Lobby thing. Um, really dislocating personhood into these very specific places, um, I think for me is a lot of what uh, the recession has done and, and the impact that it's had um, on communities. Yeah, Penelope, do you want to um, talk, uh, like the advocacy point seems directly related to part of what, what you're doing? Uh, well, I, I will think about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just sitting back here and I was like, I am so tired of looking for funding. That's what I was thinking. And I actually, as everyone was um, speaking, I was like, so relevant, so relevant, <laughs> you know, um, about the struggles for funding. And, mm. you know, I have um, myself as an advocate moved from a position where it was very possible to get funding and also to reflect on one of your other questions, which is the relationship between services and activism. Mm -hmm. And you know, in my work at the grassroots in the District of Columbia with different avenues, which was a non-identity based group working about sexual exchange issues, basically, um, you know, not calling things sex work, but just letting people name their own experience. Mm -hmm. You know, with the work at different avenues, it was very clear to me that we could get money to provide services that was essential because it's a luxury to be an activist. If you have to put food on the table and you have young children, what, what choices do you have? You know, so the service piece, like connecting people to the resources that they need and the activism seemed to be just this seamless hole in my fevered imagination in the District of Columbia. I don't think that that situation exists anymore. So, um, you know, it's, it's much harder, I think, for us to stay true to our vision of um, anti-racism, anti-oppression when working on advocacy because the resources are not there to support this really broad layer of activists. So we have to be really, what I would say about av advocacy is that um, as people with more privilege and more education, we have to be conscious all the time that these outside forces 
are not call, are not limiting our advocacy agenda. You know, when I was working at different avenues, we were constantly guided by a whole office filled with people directly involved in street economies, right? Mm -hmm. And people were framing their own, it's very much like QEJ in a way now that's that I right. think about it. That's right. And so, you know, now that those spaces are going away, for us as advocates who can keep on going, our responsibility to um, ensure that what we advocate for is linked to those issues that were in the office, you know, it still remains. And how do we do that? And I think I'm still figuring that out, which is why I was writing so relevant about the funders, so relevant. So that's my comment. I okay, that. great. Thank you. Can I jump? Uh, yeah, I, I want to jump in um, to say that um, one of the things that I think is the is the um, reality of the success of identity driven movements, um, queer, of color, feminist, um, is that the funding world has definitely been impacted by the last 20 years of that activism and has both framed its funding and hired to reflect many of those issues in very problematic and troubling ways. Mm -hmm. And so it is a, it, so part of what's so ironic about trying to get funding is that there's an ideology that funds a, a, a pool of money around sex trafficking, not sex work for example, that is a feminist, is, is presented as a feminist framework um, to make sex trafficking somehow uh, an issue different than any other kind of trafficking and more appalling, um, even though they'll agree kind of in private that it, everything's awful, but this is worse. Um, and around race and queerness that has also been a place where there has really been a decision both in terms of hiring and funding dockets to fund equality rather than a more progressive vision of change in communities of color in and queer stuff and so when you're in a in the conversations with funders um, you're in an odd conversation because it isn't as though they don't have any, it isn't as though it's all white, rich, gay men that you're then having a conversation with who don't know anything. Mm -hmm. That's not it at all. In fact, many of the people you're talking to are people that have been activists at earlier moments that you're now meeting with as your project <coughs> director. Um, and, or as the, you know, as the symbolic person placed on a board of a funder. And so I think we also have to talk about kind of neoliberalism in the reality of the funding world that they've grown to and they've changed to represent the last 25 or 30 years of struggle and to narrow it mm -hmm. so that they control what part of that activism is, is perceived as useful and often that's service driven mm -hmm. so you see larger and larger organizations of color, of feminism, of queerness, that are service providers um, in very particular ways. Um, HIV has completely kind of dropped off the face of the earth, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, and certainly as any activist radical movement. And then you have the funders coming to you with, with a set of arguments about change being defined by a very limited notion that doesn't challenge the structural questions of oppression. Mm -hmm. So you can't talk about the root causes of poverty mm -hmm. and also say capitalism in the same breath. You can say root causes of poverty, but you can't suggest that you know what those root causes are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, so it's a very odd conversation. You're not talking to stupid people. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody knows where the dance is that you have to perform. And some groups are better or considered to be more interesting at a certain moment, like you're talking about. And I think trans stuff has now become another kind of, you know, three-year funding cycle. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we need to engage with a conversation about what the politics are that, that 
underwrite that funding and what the alternatives are, not just like it's bad news, but what we do to replace the models that we've now created around that are completely embedded in foundation funding so that we aren't simply unemployed or a 501c3 because there actually has to, we have to create a third model that uses those resources when we can but doesn't depend for our existence on those resources. And that's the conversation to me that's fundamental in, in, in this panel because every single one of us are sitting here in whatever way we're funded representing a, a progressive agenda that we know is unlikely to stay um, fundable over the length of time that we need to do the change work to make a difference. And so that we really need to name it and to say that feminism and the anti work of anti-racist work and in communities of color and around queerness have all reshaped many of the liberal funders that we all go to. But what it's done is actually, I think, often um, reduced our ability to get funding if we insist on a structural analysis of what we need that money to do. Yeah. Penny, you wanted to jump in again. Yeah, and I, I realized that I had uh, left my comment on quite a negative note. Um, and, you know, when I sit back and think about the long view of what we're doing as activists for the rights of sex workers, in some way, we have made, not in some way, we have made yeah. a lot of progress in the United States. And, and that has yeah. to, despite all of these barriers, we are really changing things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot of thought and it's a lot of consideration. And we're always thinking, one thing that really impresses me about organizing in the United States is the level of thought that does go to anti-racism work, the level of thought that tries to think about this in terms of anti-oppression strategies. And in some other countries, such as my own, Australia, like mm -hmm. when I left there, like this wasn't even a debate, right. right? So I, you know, I think in the United States, there yeah, is an incredible progressive trend right. in sex worker rights organizing. Yeah. And I'm really pleased about where that will lead us in the future. Um, you know, I do see that, I mean, here's the, overview of where we went with that in terms of my experience of engaging with it. You know, people kind of trundled along until George W. Bush came in. Uh, and then um, after that moment, after a few years under uh, George W. Bush, I think the activists that felt that they might be a mainstream way of doing things, that they might get a foot in the door policy wise in Washington, D.C., realized that everything was shut to them. And I think that's the moment that sex worker rights organizing really took off mm -hmm. with Robin Few forming yeah. the SWAP yeah. and allowing people to have their local chapters, which is what Kate referred to. Mm -hmm. It was at the same moment that I started feeling I need to have a national organization in some manner, bring people together to think about it. And also my feeling at that moment was at this point, we have to organize because we have nothing to lose. I think up until that point, people were a little bit like, maybe we shouldn't say sex work. Maybe we should say we're just working with uh, people on the street, mm -hmm. right? Maybe we shouldn't talk about prostitution right. laws because mm -hmm. maybe we will, you know, maybe right. there were, and then suddenly there was nothing more to lose. And that was the, in the moment in about 2003, 2004, that sex work organizing in its contemporary form really took off and now we have a presence and we you know have been able to take these issues to the United Nations so I wanted the reason I wanted to follow up on what you were saying is I you know I think uh, in terms of advocacy questions we've lost a lot of spaces and I really mourn that but also in the longer trajectory in terms of the issue that we're talking about there has been change mm -hmm. right despite everything that they have thrown at us so yeah yes mm -hmm. I'd love to jump in yeah. and just um, just offer a few thoughts because I entered the workforce in 2009. Mm. I finished grad school um, in May of 2009. I started looking for jobs that January. I graduated, and then I didn't find a job, and that job was part-time until October. Mm. 
So I want just to kind of like give you the picture of like where I'm coming from. And um, because of that, because I entered the workforce at a time where it was so hard to find any kind of work, let alone in your field, let alone, you know, exactly the kind of job yeah. you want to do. Um, forget all those things. Forget all of those things. <laughs> I think that myself and my artist peers have a very different perspective about how to fund work. And that is that this concept of even looking for funding is like, doesn't even exist to us. Right. Um, because we, it's not like we started working for established organizations that had a steady stream of income. Um, from grantors and foundations, etc. Um, and so I think that a lot of my work in the past couple of years, I've been thinking of myself more as a social entrepreneur um, than anything else and trying to take cues from both the social entrepreneurship and the tech entrepreneurship worlds um, because I think that they're on to something and one of the things, I mean, at the most basic level, what they're on to is that if they're funding things themselves, mm -hmm. then they control the politics of it. That's, um, that's first and foremost. Um, the second thing is that um, understanding like what, how you're going to get your money is a lot about figuring out how to earn that money and how to earn it yourself. And how each organization does it is unique to them. Um, and it is a process that is not only unique to them, it is iterative, um, it changes. Um, and I think that having that as, um, as a guide is what is allowing me to keep doing the work that I'm doing um, because just the idea of the nonprofit model for small startup, community-based, individual, everything that Janet was talking about um, that, are, that are on these quests for, uh, for funds, um, it, just, it just doesn't work anymore, not to what I've been able to see, not to the peers that I've talked to. Um, and I think it's really important to shift the frame of mind that we're approaching how we're going to do the work. So this question about the relationship between um, services provided and actually doing the activist work. And for me, you know, the services, providing services is how to fund the work. As an educator, I do a lot of teaching, and the teaching brings in the money to fund the going out to do the dancing. Um, and so, and you know, like that's only one of many ways that I'm tr imagining that. Um, but I just want to offer that to the group um, also, just so that we, about just shifting and changing the frame of mind. Great. Taloma, did you want to um, jump in? Oh, yeah. I have so many thoughts. Uh, <laughs> I'm just sitting here, like, getting Really, I was watching your face. Over you, just, like, absorbing it. Um, I'm surprised, well, so the domestic violence movement is so, like, entrenched, right? It's yeah. strong. You have yeah. the Violence Against Women Act. Wouldn't you all love a law dedicated to supporting your issue? And wouldn't you allow the government to give you six-figure grants? You know, like, the potential for resources is huge. But you have to buy into a model. That's right. You have to buy into a model. And regardless of the fund, who the funder is, whether it's a government or institutional funders, I really think there is this really unholy alliance between business and philanthropy that imported all the wrong of business into philanthropy. Like mm -hmm. The financial, the investment world, the banking industry collapsed, right? We're all... We pay so for it. We're paying <laughs> for it. And yet they've imported a model from that industry into philanthropy, which is... Everything you do must be translated into a metric. That's right. A, a metric, a quantifiable metric. A and, deliverable. A deliverable, and if depending on the funder, it might be uh, dollars in the home, Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. Poverty alleviation is their thing. You must be able to convert all your work into assets brought into the home. Right. Uh, Ford also shifted into doing that. Like there's right. all these making the case, these all these reporting things. So yeah, services are. Easily, if you're an organization and you need the money, and we all need the money, That's right. you're going to find a way to quantify your outcome, and you're going to shift your way you do your work mm -hmm. into a service orientation. That's right. And the activism is unquantifiable, right? Mm -hmm. There was one. Ms. Foundation had a program called That's Movement right. Building, which all funded all of two years. Right. Now it doesn't exist. Right. Uh, there's no... And Ford, actually, when Luis Urbinas came yeah. in there, he said he doesn't believe in movement building and That's siloed right. everyone. So not even intersectional work, but right. you do your work in your silo. I'm going to never get funded by Ford again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Um, 
so what I've had to do is incredible contortionist exercises as the executive yeah. director of Saki. I'll be damned if I'm not going to get money from where I can, right? right? So when I get money from the government, it, it will, that will fund my frontline service people. Uh, and when I have to talk to people that want me to quantify my outcomes, I will quantify the hell out of everything that can be quantified. But it's on me and my team to keep our activists and our transformative work and Speaking of transformative, we're doing transformative justice work. That's right. Which is upstream for the DV movement, right? Because this is outside of a law and order approach. And the domestic violence movement has colluded with law and order in such a, a way that your only recourse, if you call me and you say, I need help, my help will be, well, let's get you a lawyer and let's get a right. order of protection yeah, and let's right. get your partner into jail. And that's not resonant mm -hmm. for the women I work with. Mm -hmm. That's not resonant for any community that's of right. color because the criminal justice, criminal... Mm -hmm. The criminal system, it's not the justice system, sorry, really is so racist. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this work. Um, there are some innovative funders that give us tiny amounts of money right. that don't really fund the whole work. But that's, I get, I go to my community and I'm like, give me money. I have, I, because I have an identity orientation, I'll go to South Asians and I'll mm -hmm. say, we do amazing work, you should fund us. You know, I try to get money from outside the programmatic aligned yeah. things to do this. But that's the only place I can get it done. I wrote a report on my maternity leave because it wouldn't be wouldn't have gotten done if you I wasn't paid for it in a way you know I wasn't yeah. paid for it and I'll do it but that's the the social cost I bear right uh, for doing yeah. this work I, I mean we should all be able to claim right. like tax deductions for the off paid <laughs> stuff that we do but when everyone is talking about I, I see the struggle struggle of the people working on sex workers and trans issues and people that are current uh, or movements that are still more on the fringe of the funding world but I you know everyone here is very aware of and I want to make sure everyone on the other side of the this little podium is aware of like even if you get funded yeah. it's very controlled right and so how, but how do we do our work you know how do how do I, I would like not I am not beholden to anyone so that's the contortionist Saki got so I've gotten money from reproductive justice so I haven't gotten money recently for domestic violence work at all you know, because it's not been out there. I've gotten money for positioning ourselves as an immigrants' rights organization because 99% of the women we work with are, I mean, 100% are immigrants. Reproductive justice work. Um, other pots of, like, civ civic integration, like, different things because yeah. there hasn't been money. Right. So I've changed, I've put on a different mask from whom I'm speaking to, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm truest right. or the work is truest vis-a-vis uh, -vis our community. And that's where you can hold us accountable. I will only be accountable to my community because mm -hmm. that's the ones that are going to hold me. The, right. the survivors of violence I work with are the ones that are my ultimate arbiters. So I will play the game, and I am playing a game vis-a-vis -vis certain funders. You know, I I will name names also if you want me to. But 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 <laughs> you, that's what I have to do as the executive director. But I, I'm going to bring up the trauma thing again because imagine you hire someone. Or even like the city. Like so, when we all lost a lot of the money, right. the the. The city, city budget gutted so many social services, including housing. We used to be able to get Section 8 vouchers. Right. We get priority housing for, for, for DV survivors. It doesn't exist anymore. And housing is such a fundamental thing when you're trying to be find a safe place to be, no matter what you're, right. what you're coming from. So imagine you put some young advocate who's you know got a job, being underpaid. I, I, I really wish we could pay our advocates more, right? But... And you say, you're going to work for your community and you're going to do this thing. But then you just can't do it because there's nothing out there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just nothing out there. Can you imagine mm -hmm. what we have to do? And you'll only be able to do one eighth of the call. Like we get 2,000 calls a year on our helpline. I have a staff of eight. Like I have only three direct service people, so we can only serve 500. Mm -hmm. So everyone else, you're going to have to find someone else for them yeah. to go to or just say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We fill a gap between social, the social service net and our community. I'm not sure I want government to be so big in order to like do everything. I want to work for my community, but I want to be resourced enough to do that. And I want to tell you, just give me money, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Like I shouldn't have to justify. Like we should all get there's a, there are two different ways you get money: programmatic support, which you have to give a budget for and you have to align it, and general operating. Just give me money, just okay. give it to me. I'll use it. Trust me to be wise to do it. And I just feel like there's this deep distrust of philanthropy and the work we do, which is why they've been. They're borrowed from the business industry to quantify our work. We want to make sure that you're really doing real, That's impactful right. work. Mm -hmm. So this is how we're going to tell you you have to tell us the story. Mm -hmm. 
why not I tell you the story of what is impactful for my community and you give me money and I will tell you then at the end of that year what I've done with that money which I find impactful but it's been really skewed the other way it's been we don't trust you to document right. your own success and so this is what we're going to do and it's been echoed all throughout this thing so I've been sitting here yep. getting angry I guess <laughs> and thank you for allowing me to vent just now <laughs> uh, well I want to open it up to the um, rest of uh, the people in the room for uh, questions in just a minute but yeah uh, and also anything else you want to say on this move that we're making now toward alternative models I think that getting that out on the table now would be really really good but Raina. Well, I think one of the themes that I feel like is playing out is um, this theme of deserving and undeserving, right? Yeah. Which also, um, I think yep. another theme that's playing out is eugenics, right? So there's yep. this idea that um, yeah. if you write, uh, if you are part of, um, if you have the ability to show how uh, your work um, really quantifiably mm -hmm. uh, helps people mm -hmm. um, in a particular way, then you're deserving. You can't do that if it's creative work, if it's um, like, you know, outside of the assimilation push that's about marriage, it's about, uh, you know, for the queer right. activists in the room, that's mm -hmm. about marriage, don't ask, don't tell, um, ending, uh, you know, right now there's this push around getting trans folks into the military. Right. Um, if it's out somehow <laughs> outside of this uh, assimilation political imagination, then that work is undeserving right? mm -hmm. and you're not going to get funded. Mm -hmm. And that's really scary for people who are navigating what I would call a system of eugenics, where uh, in New York, if you're a low income and a person of color, yeah. um, you have really regulated access to basic services, mm -hmm. whether that's um, you are looking to uh, enter a homeless shelter, or you're looking to uh, access welfare, or you're looking to get health care, like trans-related health care. So you're a trans um, person, you're low income, mm -hmm. and um, you're uh, a person of color, things are really... Um, Things are really hard, right, you know, and at the same time we have a tremendous amount of resilience. So I wanted to bring that part also into the room that we're navigating um, our basic needs being uh, particularly regulated. We're navigating our labor outside of a formal economy being criminalized and also our survival. I think rec uh, recently with the case of Cece McDonald, who is a black trans woman um, who had to fight back uh, against white supremacist attackers and ended up serving 19 months in prison for it. It highlights how people who are navigating oppression, our own survival is criminalized. Not just accessing yes. services that we may be deserving or undeserving of, but literally like maintaining our survival um, when we're particularly under attack is criminalized. And I would say all of that in an age of austerity, like we can start using the word like eugenics, right? There's a system of social control that um, says some bodies are deserving to be able to be alive and some people who are represented on this panel are not. But I think that one of the things that um, I have recently started promising myself and other community members who are navigating um, intense amounts of oppression is that we can't just talk about what's bad and how um, bad things are happening to us, but we're also, it's really important to highlight our own agency and power in the face of eugenics. Um, and I think that's because of this principle about self-determination, right? Mm -hmm. The people most affected by an issue <coughs> are powerful and capable of resolving that issue and transforming the world. And um, capitalism and colonialism, and I think it's like not a coincidence, we're still in occupied land, right? And mm -hmm. this, like, this school in New York City is built off of uncompensated um, labor, right? Mm -hmm. So like anti-black racism, reparations never happened. So it's not a coincidence that the, these things are still playing out. But I think it's really important to highlight that the people most affected are capable of changing the situation because otherwise um, we're not seen as the experts over our lives and we're not the people who are leading the movement to transform the world. Um, and so I think that hopefully um, is a, a lens that we can adopt when we're thinking about creating alternatives. Um, they need to be created by and on behalf of and with people who are currently navigating these forms of oppression. So that's, mm -hmm. that, that's helpful. Yes. No. Um, and I, I agree, and that's why I came back after my comment on um, exactly. to say, yeah. you know, actually, in the midst of all this, we are making change. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not easy, but we are. And um, this is uh, this is going to seem very very trite after such a deep comment, <laughs> but um, 
You know, when my friend Monica Jones was arrested in Phoenix yeah. after protesting this a very rights <laughs> violating police program, which is called Project Rose, yeah. which basically kidnaps people from the street and also it, it's sometimes from your own home right. exactly. uh, and then takes you down to a church to help you and give you services. I say kidnapped because they're not act, they, the police deny that they're arresting you. They say that you voluntarily take their ride in a police car. Right. So in handcuffs. Right. Uh, so <laughs> Thank you. anyway, Monica had been, my friend in Phoenix had been uh, protesting Project Rose and then within 24 hours was swept up in Project Rose yep, right. and kidnapped herself. So, uh, you know, she called me immediately after she was released and she was very <coughs> upset. It was a traumatic, extremely traumatic experience, despite what the police and social workers are saying. And uh, what she said to me is, if I have to go to court, I want everybody there wearing a T-shirt and I want other people to know about this and I really want to fight back. And yeah. so at that moment, we had sort of an agreement. We had an agreement that if she was pulled in, if, if it went to, um, if they, you know, if her arrest went forward um, and she was charged with this, that, you know, we would do everything to fight back. So in terms of alternatives, and I really is going to sound glib, but when we were, after she found out she had a court date and it was going to go ahead, uh, nobody, everyone's like, oh, what are we going to do? We don't have any money. So I said, well, I guess I could put up an Indiegogo campaign. And everyone was like, Oh, I don't know how to do that. And so I worked with everyone in Phoenix and I put up this Indiegogo campaign and I didn't want people to be disappointed that no one would support it because it was specifically for the court case of a transgender woman who uh, had experience of sex work who was fighting back against a, a, a law. And within a very short period of time, it was funded. And I think that that was the moment when the campaign really got momentum because... You know, uh, the local activists realized that other people out there cared. Mm -hmm. So Indiegogo doesn't solve all your problems. I don't want to say that. <laughs> but it was it was important in the campaign to mm -hmm. see that around the nation and from Canada, all, the, all these people just yeah. gave money yeah. to uh, provide a defense. Mm -hmm. So that was an alternative. And I think if we had gone to a funder, we would still be sitting here. You would, right. You know, we would, well, would I guess it's one fund of urgent action right. fund, but we would probably still be waiting, right? right? So mm -hmm. the Indiegogo was a crucial factor, and I don't mean to sort of say, oh, crowdsourcing will solve all your problems, but it did It did work for us. Mm -hmm. Well, and what but I hear on that... Oh, sorry. S sorry, Penny, yeah. is, is just a connection to what Sydney was saying, which is mm -hmm. that these strategies maybe need to be iterative and multiple and, yeah. you know, yeah. so, mm -hmm. and they're presented as if it's all, well, now there's crowdsourcing, so you're done. Right. Um, but rather that we need all of them. Right. Yeah. So, sorry, Tuloma. No, I mean, I think uh, one of the points of resilience that I, that I think are being mentioned, and I would just want to call out, is the turning to community. Yeah. Like, yeah. however, like so. Indiegogo and these crowdsourcing are ways to access community. Yeah. Exactly. And um, I find that that is the only source of innovation and that's the only potential source of growth in these times when everyone I talk to is like saying there's no more money done this fund and I will not fund you now and la 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 la. The community is the source of the solution. I mean, that's where we turn to. So when Saki does its transformative justice work, we're working with two volunteers from our community who work as activists, yeah. as individuals, and they're helping us. And the idea is then, as we build it into our institution, then we just become a resource for individuals engaging in this practice in our community. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's community alternatives, and it's a solution to violence, or, or it's a recourse that you know it brings community back into our work, mm -hmm. because so often we think, you should fund me for me to do this work, and I'm just a service provider. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not the lived person with the lived experience. So bringing back in community is, I think, a real point of resilience, and it really. We have so much strength, and this is just wonderful examples of ways in which it's, it manifests. Actually, QEJ had a strategy for moving our, our funding from a foundation-driven perspective to a community-based um, perspective because we had begun to really take seriously how much 
we were going to keep lucking out right. and kind of in a last desperate moment getting some money to keep going which is kind of QJ's model. Um, you know, <laughs> the when did we get your, 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 it's, it's like, like so fucking model. endless. Yeah. So, you know, we had really, really begun to have serious conversations, but we recognized that it was going to take us time to shift the way that we had understood funding mm -hmm. from a foundation-driven model to a very different way of doing it. And we had many things going for us. I mean, we had a, we had a donor base of 4,000 people that we had you know, that had given $25 or less as a majority. I mean, it wasn't like two rich people that we, whose houses we were going to go over to. Um, but it would take us time to actually do that transformation from the way that we had existed previously in foundation-driven sites. And what we were trying to do at the end was raise a significant amount of money so that over the next two years, we would have hired a development person that would work with what we had, which yeah. was our community, mm -hmm. to create a different funding base. So when the money that we had gotten ran out, we were not in the same place as when we had started it. And I now feel like part of the work I'm completely committed to is to talk with other 501c3 groups facing these same kind of issues about how to have an alternative model because it's not like we didn't know that things were hard but we had we had not learned the lesson in the deepest way we had not talked to critical resistance we had not talked to some of the other groups that have really transformed themselves from a foundation model to something else yeah. and now i think that more and more of us who have a progressive vision be, need to begin to have that conversation because I think there is a third model that's driven in a very different way and isn't, isn't simply an Indiegogo kind of model, though that's useful, but it needs a different kind of understanding that isn't driven by the way development work is now structured. And that's a different conversation. It takes a different kind of understanding and vision. And most of the groups that are confronting the crisis of foundation underwriting don't have an answer. That's what I felt like for myself. I was the ED of QEJ, and everybody would say to me, this is not a good thing, Your foundation money's going to run out, and I'd say, so what should I do? And they'd say, well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, uh, then what am I supposed to do? I'm going to go back to Ford one more time on my knees because I don't know where else to go, and I want to keep us alive. And so. Having a real idea of what I think is a different model to do, to raise money from our community and from the way we structure ourselves is a different conversation that start, needs to start happening proactively so that organizations can transition to a different, a different place where, as this Ari said to me, where foundation money is the icing and you build the cake yeah. differently so that the cake is right. underwritten by the community right. and foundation money you get or you don't get, but it doesn't kill you. Yeah, yeah Kate. Um, yeah, I think that that is, uh, this kind of third model is so mm -hmm. important as, as things kind of shift. And, um, you know, I think one thing that, that uh, has always been very palpable for me um, working in various nonprofits is that the nonprofit uh, funder relationship is really a beggar's mentality. Right. Mm -hmm. And and especially when we're talking, and it underscores the fact that yeah. <clears throat> you can fund you know, direct service provision, but you can't fund activism is because it's built on this idea that as a, as a marginalized population, you're a victim. Mm -hmm. And you fund services because they reinforce that model. Mm -hmm. If you're dependent on services, you're constantly dependent mm -hmm. on a nonprofit that is funded by a foundation mm -hmm. where they have to beg for that money anyway. And it perpetuates the same structures that are marginalizing our populations um, overall. And so, um, you know, and, and specifically talking about the sex worker movement, like literally you have to describe yourself as a victim. Who is being funded with people serving, you know, trafficking survivors? Right. And, mm -hmm. and it's an entire narrative built around victimhood. Mm -hmm. And what is activism but something that completely undermines the, the identity of, of, of a victim. That's right. Um, and so, you know, why would you fund something that's going to empower a population to make you no longer relevant? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and so I think that that has really underscored a lot of the work and undermined a lot of the work as well. Um, and so, and, I, and I, I say this because it's, it's, it's a model that I've been kind of trying to, and I think it builds on the social entrepreneurship, and, and it's, it's difficult, and it can be contentious, and it's one of those things that, you know, I'm, I'm going to say it aloud, but know how much I struggle with it both ideologically and, um, and in terms of what it looks like. But, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that's been very interesting is uh, this push to criminalize um, third-party advertisers for the sex industry. So you're mm -hmm. talking about criminalization of um, Craigslist and Backpage predominantly. Right. Um, and at the same time, uh, advertisers are not working with people in the sex trade in a victim mentality. Um, and so it's all of a sudden already reframing the discussion as we are both stakeholders in this conversation. And so one of the things that um, has been really important in trying to access different sources of funding is saying who, who has a stake in us and who does not see us as a victim? Who can we negotiate with mm -hmm. on equal terms? Because you, know, you can't even negotiate with a service provider on equal terms because they're giving you something. And so by working with people that make money off the sex trade, by working with people who understand it in a different way that don't understand it as violence against women, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the power dynamics have shifted. And I think this is kind of, um, uh, I, I have a kind of more traditional labor background many, many years ago. Um, and the idea of collective bargaining was about changing the That's power right. dynamics mm -hmm. that you worked with. And you had a stake in management, and management had a stake in you, because all of a sudden they were working with a collective body that determined their bottom line. Um, and so I think this is simply an evolution of that. I mean, what is neoliberalism but a shifting of the power structures in the world? Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to talk about that, you know, maybe it's just time to bypass a, a system that's based in criminal justice, that's based in victimhood, and that's based in re-marginalizing populations, and saying the, the locus of power is clearly shifting. Mm -hmm. And so negotiating on different terms, even if it's as, uh, you know, stakeholders, but like you, you're uh, providing a service to a client, and you want to protect that client, and you want to make sure that that client does well, you know, all of a sudden, you're both bought into the joint success of your movement. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was just listening to a podcast on the Montgomery bus boycott, um, which is really interesting. It was like an hour and a half long. And so all of a sudden I was like, wow, I didn't know that. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that really stood out to me was that these bus companies did not see this population as, 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 as fundamental. Victim. Yeah, as, as <laughs> fundamental. They saw them as all of a sudden their bottom line shifted and they lost a mass, massive part of their market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not necessarily like a human rights framework, but it's a framework that works. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, if, if the only option is to be seen as either a victim, a criminal, or, um, or a consumer, you know, if that's the way that the trend is shifting, that's the way that the trend is shifting. And I'm kind of okay with playing into that if it means that, that violence is reduced and marginalization mm -hmm. is reduced and... Um, you don't have to play into this framework. Can I ask a question uh, for people working on the sex on, on sex worker issues? There are uh, funders that have an explicit. They're like being more. They're not just funding groups, but they're setting the tone and the agenda. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh, antithetical to actually uh, liberation or uh, yeah. self determination Absolutely. framework. How are you organizing and working against this? I mean, like. Funder, like I've seen, I'm seeing, I see it in the DV movement yeah. in different but around the law and order approach. But there are other innovative ways. But this is literally they're saying that your work is the wrong way, and you know you have very powerful funders doing that. And how how do you uplift the voice? Like how do we? Because our communities are marginalized. How do we uplift our voices? Well, um, I know Kate will have a lot to say about this, uh, but uh, you know the. Odds are so stacked against us. The people who uh, are funded, uh, let's say, how do I say it? Um, the people who are talking about sex trafficking and they really believe in sex trafficking and they want the end of prostitution and that all of that, that whole sector of people, you know, they have millions and millions and billions of dollars. So my $2,000 Indiegogo, I can't stand up to that, right? Um, in that, if I try to 
if I try to take them on within that arena, mm -hmm. like it takes everything from me and my movement to try and challenge that. Mm -hmm. And so for long periods of time, I just try not to listen to it, la, 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 la. And mm -hmm. I just work on the gains that we are having and moving forward in that arena. And then every now and then we do have to, as a movement, shunt all of our very meager resources into challenging something that's very egregious, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But can, but this, this, you have no idea how big this industry is. I feel that I should perhaps make some, you know how they have those shocking newspaper, online stories like, the sex industry is worth, Three hundred trillion dollars, <laughs> right? You know, well, the industry against sex trafficking really does have three hundred trillion. It does. Mm -hmm. So you know, we we can only counter it to a degree, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it, we don't want it to completely derail us. Mm -hmm. But I would say that in a small way, we do it every day. For example, Monica, my friend, who was a who was kidnapped, uh, Project Rose is an anti trafficking initiative. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are standing up. But that's what I have to say about it. We do push back, we write a lot, we push on it, but really they have 300, well, don't, don't write that down. But we have, they have yeah, Don't put that in your papers dollars. for other professors. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's insane how much, uh, you know, trafficking is, is a very um, intense focus of mine and, and um, specifically around a lot of the, the fact that it, it incorporates like every cultural fear yeah. that we have. Like <laughs> it is really cute little white girls from Connecticut that are like abducted by men of color and then like chained to a bed and sold to other men of color. And all of a sudden they're, un they're like impure and they're all these, and you know, it just takes everything and, and wraps it up into a ball and it makes it really easy to, to sell and turn into CSI episodes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's 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 kind of an amazing thing. It's it's like watching a tsunami mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, and I think that their hubris is the greatest thing that we have. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they are pushing strategies that have an incredible amount of money towards massively failed policies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what they're doing is kind of expanding the already marginalizing work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, and showing no results. I mean, at, every single study that comes out, at, and every single proposed law that comes out, you can just point to and say, "Okay, but it's failed every single time it's been applied." There's no evidence that this does anything but make you feel better. And so I think that that is that is something that is absolutely. Um, integral to understanding the anti-trafficking movement. And I think the other part of it is that the, the hubris of their reach means that the sex worker rights movement all of a sudden became one of the most important intersectional movements That's in right. the country. Right. Um, the increase of criminalization of people in the sex trade means an increase of policing of women of color, of trans women of color, the increase in criminalizing of clients means an increased policing of men of color, the increased uh, push to um, do all these various things around youth means that all of a sudden anti-trafficking became a youth yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of a sudden, I think it has positioned the sex worker rights movement to be one of uh, the most important intersectional movements there are. Mm -hmm because of, of the work that they're doing, because the messages that they're pushing, and because of the incredible, incredible amount of damage that uh, their work is, is, is really creating. And so, you know, I, I guess well, and their stupidity inspires me. Well, there's also real pushback, not just from, this, from sex worker organizations right. that are doing remarkable work, mm -hmm. but from many of us, I think, that, that understand that, that, that how dangerous it is the, the sex trafficking money, the funding stream is now a funding stream like HIV funding, and it's generating the same kind of odd configurations that you kind of can't believe. When HIV funding kind of took off and it wasn't activist anymore, suddenly you had all these groups that were discovering HIV, and they, they would write their grants, and they would get money, and then they would call the people that had been doing the activist and community-based mm -hmm. work and say, could you come over and teach us a few things? Because mm -hmm. we just got $400 million, and you didn't get funded, but 
we got the money, but we don't really know what we're doing, so could you come on over? Um, and so I think the, the trafficking money is a really, to me it's been a shocking kind of funding stream to recognize what it was. It wasn't just a bad politics, that it was a funding stream that was huge and was pulling people in, organizations in who thought they could do the work in a way that wasn't compromised. Um, because, of course, they didn't, weren't going to do anything to hurt people. Um, and, but some, of, some foundations and, and many of us who are in on this panel that are in very different kinds of configurations have been resisting it and naming it. And that is always a problematic thing because you, I know, didn't get some funding from a place where there was where I did push where I personally did push back because I had enough power to get in there. Yeah. But in fact, it is changing the dynamic of that funding. So in ways that are really begin to articulate the real agenda. So for example, in um, sex work in sex trafficking funding, there is now in the feminist movement funding world, like Ms. Foundation, places like that. They explicitly say that none of the sex trafficking work can be done on a harm reduction model, include anybody that explicitly names that work as sex worker rights, or that recognizes prostitution as anything but a victim-driven um, circumstance. Wow. And so they've had to then, they've actually had to name their politics and make it very clear. So then places that might otherwise in a, in a, kind of different way signed on and hoped to get that $25,000 are suddenly like, Jesus, I can't even do harm reduction. I can't, even, you know. Uh. And so you can then begin to have the conversation with community-based groups about sex trafficking and the dangers that that represents and the way it's used as racism, as anti-sex, as against change work. And, and then you can say, and let me just name, Buffett as the place where that money is coming from. Yes. And Buffett is a, a liberal in the neoliberal configuration. He is not the, the Koch brothers. Mm -hmm. And that is where the millions of dollars in the feminist stream is coming from around sex trafficking. So I think you know, it's important for us to be talking with each other about these things, because really, people are desperate in 501c3s, and they see there's $25,000 to work with people they're already working with. And they think, shit, I'll get this 25, or I'll get this 100,000, or whatever it is, because, of course, I'm not doing it to, be, to trap my own community. I'm doing it because I think I can use it in a way that's strategic, and I'm keeping my focus, and I'm going to get that $50,000. And it's a longer conversation to really go to our, our groups and educate them about sex work, because most people don't have any background in understanding sex work, and the feminist movement, which had a huge fight about pornography that Carol Vance and Barnard were fundamentally important in, in redefining the sex wars which is the foundation of the sex trafficking ideology. And so I think it's really here particularly important to say these histories continue with new kind of mouthpieces, but they have, they have traction in the way that they make us victims and they do not give us recourse. And that the funding world responds to that in a very particular way and when you resist it, you pay a price. Mm -hmm. Carol has paid a price. Barnard will pay a price. <laughs> and it, you know, it has ramifications. And we have to be smart about those ramifications because they really matter. I, I do want one clarification because I don't want anybody to have the wrong impression. If you look around the room, you might guess that Barnard was on the wrong side. <laughs> Barnard was on the wrong side on because one, it, did, so. it made pleasure an equal voice to danger. And so, you know, I think that this stuff is really critical for us to talk about because when we're talking about what we're challenging, that is what we're talking about is in the anti-porn 
war of which I was a part, I thought I was fighting Andrea Dworkin. But I didn't think I was fighting Buffett. Um, you know, it felt like the terrain was, un, you know, was a contested terrain, but it was, it wasn't a funding stream. Now there's millions and millions and millions of dollars that grassroots organizations desperately need, and they think that that's a place. And like the way that these conversations happen, of course you wouldn't support sex trafficking, would you? Nobody would support sex trafficking. So trust me, like it was around pornography, it's very difficult to say, actually, I'm going to have a conversation with you about what you think sex trafficking is, because this is not a blank slate. And it, that is a scary place to politically frame the issue. And most of us that haven't come through the sex wars don't know how to talk about it in a way that pushes back mm -hmm. against the kind of conversation that people insist you must have, which is, of course, that sex trafficking, which hits the most vulnerable, that's always the framework, is the place that, that of course, you wouldn't agree to. And therefore, the funding stream is an important stream that supports communities of color and trans women and poor queer people and folks that are you know, struggling with domestic violence because sex trafficking is the result mm -hmm. of sex, you know, of, of sexuality and heterosexism and, you know, and so it's like, shit, you gotta stand up in a room and say, actually, I'm not gonna have this conversation about sex trafficking like it's real. I'm not gonna have that conversation. I'm gonna have a conversation and frankly, I, having been a sex worker for many, many years, part of why I get to stand up in that room and not get contradicted is because I'm willing to name my own history. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it hard to argue with me mm -hmm. about what I know and what I don't know. So what they've done is leave out sex workers from the conversation about sex trafficking mm -hmm. in the funding stream so that we couldn't resist when those conversations were being constructed by funders. And that, it, to me, was really interesting when they had to finally say, no sex work organizations, no sex worker organizations, and no organizations that um, did harm reduction as the model around sex trafficking could, could, get, could even enter the conversation about the funding stream. So let's say thank you one more time. <laughs>